Hey everybody, greetings from beautiful Whitefish, Montana. It is in the thick of winter, mid-January. I'm sitting here um, right at the foot of the beautiful Whitefish Mountain Resort and Whitefish Lake, where I have lived for, gosh, almost 30 years now, um, and raised two children. In fact, right now I'm sitting in my daughter's, um, on my daughter's deck because in typical mountain fashion, the power went out last night. <laughs> So to that end, um, because this is for the Boulder Bookstore, we love you Boulder, I figured you Colorado people would understand. Um, so I've basically been sort of like living in my truck. Um, there's no running water or septic or anything at my house. And so I don't have a copy of my book. But what I do have are some really earnest, kind, insightful questions um, from the Boulder Bookstore. So I'm going to answer them and I'm going to begin with just reading a very short excerpt from the book. The book is called Willis Grove. It came out last March. The paperback is coming out in just a few months this March. I'm so thrilled about it. It hit the USA Today bestseller list and I can only imagine that it has something to do with the fact that the central theme of the book is a question that we're all asking right now and trying to answer. And that question is, so now what? Never when I wrote the book could I have imagined how timely it would be. What I want this book to do is start a movement. So the idea of the book was inspired by my Haven Writing Retreats. I've been leading those for eight, nine years now. Of course, I can't do it right now. I'm doing stuff online, my Haven Home eight-week course, etc. Um, but what I wanted to capture in this novel was what happens when people leave their usual lives, their daily lives, for the express purpose of trying to move forward in their life. And in, in, in the way that we do it at Haven, it's using the, the power of the written word. In this book, it's not at all about a writing retreat. It's about four women who are all at major crossroads moments in their lives, who are coming together to answer this powerful question. They've all said yes to this invitation, and that is, so now what? And certainly we're all asking that right now. So at the very end of the book, I'm gonna read this to you because to me this is the call to action. To me this is the movement I wanna start. I want people to, instead of isolating during hard times, I want them to come together and to tell each other their stories and to create a safe space, to hold that space, to make it safe to do just that. So here's the letter to the reader at the end and then I'll read you the invitation that they all say yes to and then I'll answer these very thoughtful questions from the Boulder Bookstore. Again, thank you Boulder Bookstore for supporting authors in the way that you do. So, in a perfect world I would have my book with its beautiful cover right here but instead I've got the original document <laughs> because as I've learned as an author, the writer's ego never gets to explode. It's all about doing the work. For, the, for those of you who are writers, it's all about doing the work. So there's a line in the book that comes from one of the four women, and it's this. You know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. I'm gonna to read it one more time. You know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. And that's what the book is about. It's about community and boy do we need community more than ever, whether online or in person. Let's hope it can be in person soon. So here we go. Dear reader, I have learned something that might just be the most important lesson of my life and I would like to share it with you. There is a language that we crave, a language of the heart that grows from our worry and our wonder and our stories rooted in our experience of this beautiful and heartbreaking thing called life. Too many of us have trained ourselves out of speaking that language. We were all fluent in it when we were children, but somewhere along the way we were taught or conditioned to forget it, to not be honest when we are asked, how are you? And to not really listen to the answer when we ask others the same question. So many of us have lost our authentic voices and reduced our conversations to grocery store talk and texts with an emoji at the end. The truth is, we long to be seen and heard and accepted, especially when we are in pain. Yet out of fear of judgment or rejection, we too often draw in and become islands rather than bridging to our family or friends. I know this because at times I've made that choice and the fallout from that led me to devote a major piece of my life to bringing people together in safe, intimate circles of self-expression, which led me to write this book. I wrote Willis Grove to capture the power of people stepping out of the isolation and self-doubt that so many of us feel in times of transition and instead gathering together. 
these women show us that we don't have to endure hardship alone, nor should we. We have choices. If, for whatever reason, connecting with our usual community is too fraught, we can instead create temporary circles, friend to friend to friend to friend, carving out small interludes from our daily lives in order to focus on what comes next. To have those conversations that we need to be having but aren't, to move boldly outside of gossip, small talk, pretending, and into the connection we so deeply need. I hope that in reading this book and in the spirit of Willa, Bliss, Harriet, and Jane, you will be inspired to reach out to your own dear friends, whether close by or far away, and that you will invite them to come together for short respites to support one another in the powerful way that people can when they give themselves permission to say yes to the profound invitations of their lives. My mission is this. We will start a movement of week-long interludes from the stresses and pain of our crossroads moments and in radical and real communication we will provide ourselves and our kindreds with a map for our next steps. Our voices deserve to be honored and heard. No one has your voice. No one. However we speak, now is the time for truth. And yes, we don't have to do it alone. Yours, Laura. So that's the letter to the reader, and that's the intention that I set uh, for myself when I wrote the book. I, I wanted to capture what happens on the Haven Writing Retreats that I see year after year, retreat after retreat, over a thousand alums from all over the world in every demographic I can imagine. They always say, we're your best group, right? Like it couldn't possibly be like this again, and I have to break them the news that it just always is. And so I thought, how can I capture that in a book? Again, not about a writing retreat but about what happens when people come together leaving their daily lives leaving them the the this you know perhaps shame or or isolation that happens so often when when we're in these crossroads moments and coming together to be honest and vulnerable and transparent with one another in a safe setting and so willa and harriet and jane and bliss were born and then they told the story. So here's how it begins. This is the invitation that, that Willa is inspired to write after she finally comes clean with Bliss and says, listen, my life's in shambles, I'm hiding. Um, and Bliss says, me too. And then Bliss says, and I know somebody else who is, and I bet that person knows someone too. And they come together to tell those stories and help each other figure out the answer to, so now what? So here's how the book begins. The women. On a typical day in their typical lives, Three women went to their mailboxes and found, amid junk mail and bills and shiny flyers for unshiny things, an invitation sealed with a bold W pressed into sage green wax. They had been waiting for this invitation. They longed for it as much as they feared it, because to break this seal was to release a behemoth of a question, a question so impossible that they had almost stopped asking it. Each hesitated, looked around, and in respective order thought, sweet Jesus, well, what the hell, here goes nothing, and slid her finger under the seal, revealing a thick handmade note card pressed with silvery leaves. Words winked up at them, words that might, if given the chance, change everything. They swallowed hard and pulled out the card. Inside, the nestled with a wild bird feather were the following words, you are invited to the rest of your life. You know you can't go on like this, not for one more day. You need an interlude. Imagine this, you are in a farmhouse in Montana, wrapped in a soft blanket, sitting by a warm wood stove. There's a cup of tea in your hand, just the way you like it. There are women surrounding you who need this just as badly as you do. We all have the same question. The question is, so now what? Come to Montana and find out. <laughs> Love, Willa. You don't have to do this alone. Each woman held the invitation to her heart, drew in a deep breath before letting out an exhausted sigh that echoed from Connecticut to Wisconsin to California and back to Montana and went inside to call a dear friend. Okay, so that's how the book begins. And now I'm going to get to these great questions from the Boulder Bookstore. So I've already sort of answered number one, which is what was the inspiration for the book? What was the inspiration for the book? So like I said, I just kept seeing such phenomenal things happen for people on these retreats. 
And I thought, how can I capture that? How can I capture the movement, the shifts that happen in just five days for people? So I decided to come up with four central conflicts that I felt were really relatable in our zeitgeist. Reasons why people might be isolating out of shame or fear of judgment or feeling guilty or things didn't work out the way they thought. One is um, Willa's conflict and that is the Emersonian dream of self-reliance versus the need for interdependence or community. And this is all inspired by her dear husband Jack dropping dead at a very early age, leaving her to tend to this town where they were the cornerstone in this sort of Emersonian self-reliant dream, only to realize that she actually needs a lot more than she thought in the realm of self-reliance. And so she's isolating because of it. Um, and then we have Harriet, who is a lot of fun to write. And her central conflict is addiction to ambition, addiction to ambition. And I think that's really related, relatable for a lot of people. And then uh, Bliss's central a conflict is faith versus religion. Faith versus religion. That, that was a really interesting one to, to break down and parse. And then Jane's central conflict is something that is fascinating to me and that is that money doesn't bring you happiness. It brings you comfort and choices but not necessarily happiness and that's an important one to break down too. All of these all of these conflicts are things that we don't necessarily talk about when people say, how are you? Because there's a lot of stigma attached to them. So I thought, why not go there? And I did. They did. So, so that was the inspiration for the book, Haven Writing Retreats, and also just my fascination with the conflicts that get in our way, how we get in our own way because of them, and then the invitation to finding resolve for them. Um, did these characters come to you fully formed or did you have to find and flesh out the characters to tell the story you wanted to tell? Yes is the answer and anybody who writes fiction will probably agree with this that ultimately the characters write the book. And so because I was so interested in trying to capture the power of people leaving their regular community and creating temporary community, I was already, you know, I was like preaching to my own choir and I realized that there, it was too preachy. So after I wrote the whole first draft, you know, the whole thing from once upon a time all the way to the end, like 400 pages, I realized that I sort of wanted to take a shower. I felt like it was way too heavy handed and prescriptive. So I decided to get much deeper into my understanding of the characters and let them write the book. And once I did that, a whole world opened up. So that was draft two. The book that's on the bookshelves now is draft 19. So it took about eight years to write, which is about par for the course. But really, if you are somebody thinking about writing a novel, um, and it's even interesting if you like to read novels, notice how the characters actually beget the story, oftentimes more than the plot begetting the characters. That's the kind of writer I am, at least, and the kind of books I like to read and write. So the next question is, your novel centers around a group of women coming together to heal from trauma and connect with one another. Have you participated in a group like this before? That's such an interesting question. So I've already said that yes, absolutely, I lead those groups. I'm very close to those sorts of groups and the dynamic, but only from a leadership perspective. And so part of what I want to do is actually be in a group of four in the way that these characters are. So my hope is that people will read this book and say, you know what, I want to have my own grove. I want to have it be, you know, let's say your name is, is Abigail, Abigail's Grove. And then you ask, Abigail asks one person who's in a crossroads moment. Then she, that person that Abigail asks, asks a, th uh, a third and then that person asks a fourth. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be great for me to be a part of that too so that I'm not leading it. Um, so I've got that, I'm cooking that up. It just, um, before COVID, I was going to do it with uh, four different women. We had the whole thing figured out. Hope, hopefully we can be doing that in 2021. So I think it's really important for those of you who, who lead groups, we have to be fed too, right? We have to fill up our cup. And so I think um, I can't wait to be able to be in a group like this and not leading it, although I miss dearly leading uh, Haven in, in person and hopefully we'll be able to do them in 2021. I do have the ranch uh, where I lead them reserved for uh, two in June, two in September, and one October. We shall see. So the next question is, why do you think a novel like this is so important for women to read? And I, I think I can answer that in a very quick way, especially since I read the letter to the reader at the beginning. Why do you think a novel like this is so important for women to read or anybody to read? Um, for me, it's because we need to know that we're not alone. 
That is the number one bit of, of fan mail that I get from, from people, whether it's from an essay I've written or a short story or my memoir, This Is Not the Story You Think It Is, which was a New York Times bestseller, or Willis Grove, which is a novel. People say, thank you for speaking truth. Thank you for speaking heart language. It helped me to know I'm not alone. And if that's what my work does, then you know, then it's worth being so transparent, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I always say that fiction is distilled reality. For me, it's almost realer than real. You can hear the train. We have a the train comes right through Whitefish, which I love. Um, okay, what is your pr writing process like? Well. I, my writing process is much the way I teach it to others, which means that it needs to be flexible. I always say that I've raised flexible children, case in point, that my daughter it just came off the ski mountain and is sitting there holding my iPhone on her deck, <laughs> filming her mother. Um, I've raised flexible children and I think it's the same with the writing process. I don't want it to be that I only write on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on this one computer in this one room after doing this one ritual with this one candle. No. I want to be able to write wherever, you know, wherever the, the muse moves me. And um, so I think that's really important. So right now, um, you know, before COVID and the kids came home, I was an empty nest and so I had all kinds of time to write. Before that, when they were home, you know, summer was all about baseball for my son, so summer wasn't a great time to write. Winter was full of more dormancy. You know, it, it really is about finding and committing to a writing practice that works for you based on your responsibilities and your habits and who you really are, not how someone else does it. So some people are out there saying write every day, I disagree with that. Just set yourself up for an authentic relationship with your writing based on exactly who you are, knowing that that's a movable beast, that that changes. Okay, next question. Um, what have you been doing during the pandemic to connect with others when in-person gatherings aren't possible? So I'll read that again. When have, what have you been doing during the pan pandemic to connect with others when in-person gatherings aren't possible? Well, um, I've been doing So Now What workshops, which I was doing on the road when I was promoting the hardback. Um, in person and then I took them online and that's been really great. They're five-hour workshops. I've stopped doing those now. Um, I loved doing them though because people really, uh, to me, th those weren't for writers at all. It was about using the power of the written word to help you shed the past, focus on what you can embrace right now and then move forward into your life, move forward into your so now what. And um, I think that those really helped people during the pandemic and, and still are. Um, I do something every single Friday and have since March, with the exception of three Fridays, um, and that's a one hour so now at journal writing practice. And that's free and we do it on Zoom and people show up when they want to. Some people show up every single week. Some people just showed up once. Some people show up just whenever the spirit moves them. So that's something you can find on my website, which is lauramonson.com. It's just my gift to people. I, I always say that writing should be up there with diet and exercise in the realm of preventative wellness. And I know that for me, I also say writing has been my practice, my prayer, my meditation, my way of life, and sometimes my way to life. And so I want to help people know that that's a, an important tool for them to use and I can help people with that. Um, the other thing that I've been doing and I mentioned earlier is that I'm, I'm launching an, an eight week online course. In January um, I'm not sure when this is going to air and that goes through March 12th and then I'll probably be doing it again later on in 2021 so stay tuned for that if you're interested it's full of incredible industry experts lots of writing and teaching and community which we all need so dearly right now and that's also at lauramonson.com and it's called Haven Home so that's what I've been um, doing in terms of connecting with others to help in terms of just my own personal life I've been really really quarantined you know um, when I'm with people it's my my 20 year old it's been kind of a parade of 20 year olds and it makes this mama very happy um, what have you been reading during quarantine uh, to keep up your spirits what have I been reading well I've been editing um, an, a lot because I can't teach in, in uh, person so I've been editing a lot of my clients books and that really keeps up my spirits because it's been amazing to see how many people during the pandemic have truly committed to not only finding their voice but finally tackling that writing project. So I've been editing almost full time during this time and that has definitely lifted my spirits. You know, for me, I think during hardship, it's, it's, I like to keep things simple. So rather than tackling a novel or, you know, War and Peace or something or finally, you know, reading all of the, the Russians from beginning to end, I've been reading poetry. 
and some of my favorite poets, my literary hero, may he rest in peace, a one time Montana man, but originally from the Midwest like myself, Jim Harrison. Jim Harrison, I love his poetry. His, his book, The Theory and Practice of Rivers is one of my very favorites. I love Wendell Berry. I love Naomi Shahab Nye, I'll say that again, she's fantastic. Naomi Shahab Nye, N-Y-E. I love her poetry, especially I love her poetry called um, Valentine for Ernest Mann. And I've also been reading, um, of course, Mary Oliver because she helps no matter what. Um, and, um, and really, uh, I've also been really reading Terry Tempest Williams again because I think reading about open space is good for the soul and she writes about it so eloquently. Um, it's because of Terry that I actually wrote a memoir. She is a great uh, champion of writers as well. And so we've got one more question and the last one is, can you read us a short passage from your book? And I already did that. Um, so I think that basically, Boulder Bookstore is asking me to um, also let you guys know about any social media handles. Um, you can always find me on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, which is Laura Munson Author. I have a lot of fun on Instagram. And again, my website is lauramunson.com. I hope that you will read Willa's Grove and that Willa and her women will land in your heart. The book is as much a love letter to Montana as it is to community and right now we need those things we need open space we need to be in wilderness we need to be in the wilderness of our own beings our minds our hearts our souls and we need each other so I hope that you'll pick up Willis Grove and that it will land in your heart and from Whitefish Montana and the Whitefish Ski Mountain and Whitefish Lake and the train it's all here from my daughter's patio happy 2021 to you all may it be full of blessings